giving you exclusive access to the minds of industry leaders in this special edition of Brand USA Talks Travel, recorded live in London. Brand USA Travel Week, UK and Europe, brings together key players in the US, UK, and European travel industry to discuss trends, challenges, innovations, and the opportunity to drive future visitation to the United States. Here's your host, Mark Lapidus. Sustainable tourism requires collaboration across travel sectors and investment in new technology. Our panelists in this episode from Travel Week examine how travel and sustainability go hand in hand. You'll hear perspectives on consumer demand, industry commitments, trends, and best practices, plus government policies related to sustainable tourism. Here's your moderator for today's panel, Brand USA Senior Vice President of Public Affairs, Aaron Wooden Schwartz. Good afternoon, everybody. We've obviously seen really significant headlines uh, over the last several months about you know record-setting summers here in the Northern Hemisphere. Obviously, we're familiar with the fires in Greece and, and even some of the Spanish islands. Questions in The Economist about what, what the future of the visitor economy will be in Southern Europe. And even in the Southern Hemisphere, again, record-breaking uh, heat waves in Australia, Brazil, Chile, and so forth. And even in the United States, of course, you know, it seems like almost every year is a new record, new record set uh, in all these metrics. At the same time, uh, we're really cognizant of the consumer demand for sustainability. For example, a 2022 study from Expedia suggested that you know, 90% of consumers would look for sustainable options when selecting their travel uh, experience, and that on average, consumers are willing to pay 38% more to make their travels more sustainable. Obviously, those are what we call stated preferences, and kind of where that stacks up against other considerations, like cost and budget, is a little bit TBD, but clearly the impulse is there and growing from the consumer. You know, at the same time, the US, the travel and tourism industry globally, but especially in the United States, is unmistakably shifting its posture to a much more proactive stance on sustainability. But I would say, and you'll hear more about that today, but it, despite those changing dynamics, it really is not well understood even among the travel industry, all that's going on, and certainly in the marketplace where it really needs to be understood. We hear from the travel trade, we hear from the consumer, we hear from the media, just how important this is for the future of the business. And you're gonna hear a lot about some of the progress and commitments that have been made, even though we do know there is clearly more to do. So we've got a critical panel here that I'm, I'm so excited to, to bring to you all. Starting down at the very end, we have Nate Use, the head of research from the World Travel and Tourism Council, WTTC. Chip Rogers, who's the president and CEO of the American Hotel and Lodging Association, and Eric Hansen, senior vice president at the U.S. Travel Association. I'll just note before we start the panel that obviously the scope of this topic is much more than we would ever be able to cover in only 40 minutes. And our objective today really is to narrow down on some definitions and to talk specifically about the climate aspects of sustainability and what's being undertaken in the sector in order to foster a long-term sustainable future. So, Nates, starting with you. We often hear this word sustainability. It's, it's a very buzzy word. I sometimes think it can be a very general term. So I'd like to start by getting a sense of what exactly does sustainability mean and what does it mean in the context of the travel and tourism industry? Sure, I could spend the entire session talking about the definition of sustainability, but in a nutshell, so it means let's not compromise the needs of the current generation and also not compromise the needs of the future generations. So it's really about the balance between three different pillars, economic pillar, social pillar, and environmental pillar. So when it comes to travel and tourism specifically, on the economic side, we're looking at the economic impact of travel when it comes to spending by international and domestic visitors. It's about having the right balance of the two as well. It's looking at leisure versus business. It's also looking at things like seasonality of arrivals in the destination, how can we sort of move some, um, some travelers from the core city centers to the periphery to really spread those economic benefits. Then on the social side, we're looking at sort of like workforce, at jobs, composition of that workforce when it comes to gender, wage, and also like age distribution of, uh, of the employment, and also more broadly about diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging, we call it, in short, DIB, so, it's, so that's also really key. Then climate impact comes under the env environmental pillar, and that's what's been gaining the most media attention recently because of the number of events you mentioned. I'm from Slovenia, we had enormous floods in August. Um, you know, on the other side of Europe, in Greece, there were wildfires, and every single year is going to, it's, it is going to be the worst year on record unless we do something. So on the environmental front, uh, we need to measure things like greenhouse gas emissions, energy use, water use, the resource input, wild fish catch, for instance, 
or wood. And it's really important to measure everything in balance. So, so, so like looking how all interacts together. Thank you very much, Nate. So, so Chip, is this sustainability something that's important to the US lodging, hotel and lodging sector? Why is it important? What is the sector doing uh, in the sustainability space? It's important because consumers tell us it's important. Um, and I think sometimes that gets lost. I mean, we can all have this idea of what we individually want to accomplish and, and, and try to encourage people to join whatever vision we might have. But when consumers say with a loud voice, we want you to do this, if you don't do it, then you don't get their dollar. You don't get their purchase. And so consumers are increasingly telling us this. We looked at this, actually, we measured this uh, pre-pandemic about when people are making decisions on where, what hotel to stay in. Location's always gonna be number one. You're not gonna choose a hotel that's not near where you need to be. We're never gonna supplant that as number one, but sustainability was not really even on the list. Like people weren't even looking at it. And now it's, it's one of the top three decisions. Now, how does that translate into actually spending money? That's a different story. We see the sentiment is, I want to stay at a, at a sustainable hotel. The question is, am I willing to pay for it? And you see a lot of people, in fact, there was a study recently that showed not just the intent to travel, but what is preventing you from purchasing that sustainable hotel stay and cost was, was number one. So there's no question about that. So we represent the entire U.S. industry. And, and since most of the global corporate entities that are large in the hotel business are based in the U.S., we get the honor to represent them as well. And so when we're looking at bringing our in industry together, there are challenges at times because Marriott, Hilton, Hyatt, IHG, they are hyper competitive. And if they find something where they believe they can get a competitive edge, they want to take advantage of that. And so when we say, hey, let's all come together on sustainability, there might be some apprehension on their part of saying, well, we're doing our thing, you guys do your thing. The problem with that, that approach is, is that consumers don't really understand. And the greatest analogy I can give you is back during uh, COVID, if you recall, we were all trying to figure out a way, well, I was trying to figure out a way to get people back into hotels. Like, you know, running 10% occupancy means you're going to go out of business rather quick. So how do we get people back in? And the single biggest concern was it's got to be clean and safe. And then you started thinking about, well, what are hotels doing? And every hotel had their own thing. If you remember checking into a, a Hilton hotel, they had literally had the sticker on the door when you open it up. So it would rip the sticker in half that said clean by Lysol. Was that good, bad? I don't know. It, it seemed to work. Consumers liked it more power to Hilton, but they jumped out on that. Marriott did something. They were all doing their own thing. And so we brought them together and created a program called Safe Stay. And Safe Stay was meant to say, are there standards, cleaning standards, whether it be masking, cleaning, tools, air quality that we're using that all hotels across the board, whether you're the smallest mom and pop to the largest resort, that all of you can agree will at least do this. And we were successful in doing that. And so now we're looking at the environment, sustainability really the same way. Are there tools that every hotel can, can use, no matter what type of hotel you are, as a baseline? And the reason that's so important is so we can convince consumers that, all right, it doesn't matter which hotel I go to, at least they're going to be doing this. Now, if Marriott wants to go above and beyond, more power to them. We certainly encourage that. If they want to use it as a marketing tool to gain a larger market share by saying we're more sustainable, we're doing these additional things, again, more power to them. So we create, created Responsible Stay. It's about operations, and I'll, I'll close this answer with this. We're focused, hyper-focused on operations. What are we doing on a daily basis at the smallest mom-and-pop hotel all the way to the largest resort so that everybody's doing the same thing? Because all of these hotels, all these spaces are different. So I, I, I think about this building we're in right now, right? When we start measuring carbon impact, if we're only looking at the structure itself, it's very difficult in our space. If you walk outside this building, right outside the, the Marriott, which is connected to it, it says home of the London government. And it, it lists the years there, I think until like 1990, this building was the home of the London government. If they really wanted to be 100% sustainable and build a sustainable building, some would argue, tear it all down and rebuild a better building. That's not necessarily a good idea especially in our space. So we have to be able to have operationally standards that can apply to all hotels. And that's what we're doing with Responsible Stay across the board. One thing I'll mention on waste reduction, which sometimes doesn't get a lot of, a, a lot of discussion, we created this program called Hotel Kitchen with WWE. We test marketed on a, a large number of hotels. Those hotels that just use the, and you can go to our website and find it, but they just use the things we were talking about, Hotel Kitchen, the best practices, reduced food waste by 38% with almost no cost, right? In fact, it saves them money by reducing food waste. So simple things like that, if you can get standards that everyone will adopt, can make a difference, but the key is the adoption. And if you make it too difficult, 
people are just going to say, well, I, I can't do that. If you say, no, we can start here and, and we can meet these standards, people will join in. And just one point of clarification, the, the kitchen program you dug into, that's with WWF. WWF. Yeah, if you're in the United States, WWE is a big wrestling venture. <laughs> uh, I don't think they, they eat a lot of food. They don't care about <laughs> waste reduction. But. Thank you, thank you, Chip. Um, so Eric, U.S. Travel Association, you guys really are the umbrella sort of advocacy organization for all of the segments of the travel space in the United States. So I guess zooming out a little bit, more generally, you know, why are sustainability and climate efforts important? What are you hearing from your members? And, you know, from your perspective, how has the, the discourse around this changed over the years? You know, I, I think starting with how the discourse has changed is important. We have to acknowledge that this wasn't always an issue that was top of mind for the entire travel industry. When I joined U.S. Travel 10 years ago, we looked at getting involved in sustainability. There was no question that it was important, but whether or not it related to our mission was a different question. We have a mission to increase travel to and within the United States. And there were two aspects that held us back from engaging on sustainability. The first is that when it came to the consumer, the prevailing wisdom was that they held sustainability near and dear to their hearts, but they didn't vote that way with their wallet. So sustainability for uh, the business was really about maybe competing for a certain segment of travel, maybe with a small number of people who were looking at sustainability when they were going to a hotel, but it wasn't something that was about growth, it was about competition. I think the second issue is that there are so many different approaches to sustainability where the challenges a hotel uh, are facing are gonna be vastly different than what an airline is facing, vastly different than what a car rental company is facing. So what's the common thread there for the industry to get involved? And because there were so many different approaches, we just stayed away from the issue entirely. That has absolutely changed. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, there are two things now uh, that we have to realize that have changed, that have catapulted this to one of the uh, top issues that we work on. Uh, the first is that the consumer mindset has changed. You mentioned the Expedia interview, 90% are searching for sustainable travel options. But leisure travelers and consumer travelers are now uh, voting with their wallets. In that same survey, 64% said that they are making decisions based on sustainable options. What's available in transportation? <coughs> what's available in lodging? What's available for the destination? And then 74% said they would be even willing to pay more uh, for those travel products and services. So we're seeing it in the leisure travel market. We're also seeing it in the business travel market. And this has, uh, I think, created a huge uh, sea change for the travel industry. Uh, meeting players were showing up at hotels and saying, uh, you have to show me uh, what your sustainability practices are in order for me to book a large meeting or event at this location. They were saying that to convention and visitors bureaus. So now all of a sudden it's an issue about growth. Mm. Uh, companies like Deloitte, which are putting tens of thousands of business travelers on the road each day, they are making commitments to go carbon neutral uh, within the next 10 to 25 years. They don't produce anything. So their carbon footprint is all from travel and they have an option, which is to travel less, or to travel more sustainably. And now that's an issue about growth. So we're seeing it in business travel. And then in international travel, there's no question that that market has always been a little ahead of the curve uh, for the market in the US. And that's only can continue to grow over the time. So for those three segments, now it was an issue about growth. We're seeing it in consumer trends. Uh, that's why it's critical. I would say the second piece is that we're seeing the climate change. Mm -hmm. The second thing that really changed. Uh, this year alone, we saw floods in, in New York uh, and in Vermont. We also saw floods in the desert. As the uh, ocean warms uh, and as sea levels rise, uh, there's a huge impact on beach erosion. We were seeing coral reefs completely wiped out. Those are huge environmental attractions that sustain entire economies mm. across the travel industry. Uh, so this is not just about business success, this is about business survival. And I think for those reasons, because it's about growth, because it's about survival, uh, it went from uh, individual initiatives to an industry imperative, and I think that's where we are today. Great, thank you, Eric. Um, so, Nate, it's back to you. We've, we've heard a little bit now about what's happening across the U.S. Uh, travel and tourism industry, but WTTC, you all are about to release a, a really groundbreaking global study about uh, sustainability and travel. Well, first of all, if you can, when, when can folks expect to see that study? But also, what can we expect to see in that study, and what are some of the trends or you know, best practices you're seeing around the world? We have actually been releasing some of the figures over the last few months. Um, most outputs will be available from next week onwards, so it's, it is coming okay, out soon. Um, it is a groundbreaking study. For, for a number of years, we have been quantifying the economic impact of travel. And now for the first time in our history, we have sort of like really developed the sustainability framework, bringing together all of our economic data, environmental data, and social data. So there are only like a few indicators here I want to highlight. Greenhouse gas emissions, and I'm looking at the energy use, and uh, the industry's um, breakdown in terms of the emissions 
In 2019, when our sector was at its peak, in the US, travel and tourism contributed just over 8% to the overall country emissions, which is in line with the global average. But what is, so this is now status quo. We know where we are starting from. What is also really interesting is that in the US, as well as in North America on average and the world, we are seeing travel and tourism GDP increasing at a faster rate than the emissions from the sector. This means that our sector's economic growth is decoupling from its greenhouse gas emissions. That's the movement in the right direction. But what we really want to see is travel and tourism GDP growing whilst absolute emissions reducing so that we can really reach net zero. And there are some great examples around the world of countries which have achieved this in the last decade, including Germany, for instance, Slovenia, and a few Scandinavian countries as well. Um, one note here, we are, so here we're looking at the full impact, the full environmental impact, um, including scopes one, which is looking at the direct consumption of travel and tourism services and emissions from those, uh, from that consumption. We're looking at scope two, which is purchased electricity. And then we're also looking at scope three, which is the entire supply chain, plus international transport emissions as well. So it's a full impact. What our data also allows us to do is to look at which industries are contributing the most to greenhouse gas emissions. And unsurprisingly, really, transportation is number one in the, US, in the US as well as globally. In the US, it accounted for nearly 50% of overall tourism emissions. This is then followed by utilities, which is purchased electricity. And then emissions come from a wide range of uh, different industries, including manufacturing as well, and then agriculture. So this really is important because it guides our decision making. If we, not, like now we have the data and we can devise solutions. And based on this, it's really a multi-stakeholder approach which will lead us to net zero, including the introduction of electric vehicles and the rollout, sustainable aviation fuels, but also making our national grid greener. And for example, also food production, you can see is featuring quite highly here as well. So making the entire food production greener. My last point here is about the energy. So energy intensity has also been decreasing over time in the US and globally, which is a movement in the right direction. And the uptake of low carbon energy has been on the upward trajectory from just over 4% in 2010 to 5.4% in 2021. Now in the US, with an introduction of Inflation Reduction Act, we expect this to accelerate over the next decade. Chip, turning to you, and obviously we've, we've seen here how travel and tourism is, is part of you know, an ecosystem of uh, a larger economy, a larger society, and is not separate from all of these other uh, contributing factors. And of course, the hotel community is also embedded uh, in its local economy and in its community. So about a year ago, you, you hosted a really important conference in Washington, D.C. to launch this uh, Responsible State Program. And I was there and I was very impressed that it, it was not only the, the large lodging brands, but you had all of the sort of uh, management companies and the suppliers and even financing folks there and really a whole of ecosystem approach to uh, this, this sustainability and responsible stay. So I'm wondering if you could dig in a little bit deeper and just give us a few more examples that really stand out either on the lodging brands or in the, in the larger community of what folks are doing and how they're achieving those um, commitments that they've made. Yeah, and I think it's really important to always remember, and this is one, one of the things we have to, I have to talk to the media about, I have to talk to lawmakers about all the time, is what is the hotel structure? And in general, it is a franchise, a franchisee, and a management company are the three legs of the stool. And so any brand can come out and say, we're going to do this. But it's the franchisee and or the management company that actually has to follow through it and do it. And so that, that stuff is really, really important. You can do that through incentives or you can do that through brand mandates. Um, there are some great success stories. I mean, think about IHG. This was years ago. They decided globally to get rid of the single-use plastics. What is that, what's the result been? 850 tons of savings a year in plastic. Marriott had a goal back in 2016, by the year 2025, to reduce carbon emissions by 30%. They're already at 25%, so they're getting it done. In the United States, uh, Hilton just introduced Hotel Marcel, which is in New Haven, Connecticut, the first zero emissions hotel in the United States. Go to New Haven, see the hotel. I heard it's cool, I haven't seen it yet. And they have amazing pizza. It's voted the best city in America for pizza. So if you're going to New Haven, Connecticut, you gotta get pizza. Omni Hotels, for example, um, and they're interesting because they are not a franchised brand. So when they make a decision, they can just implement it, which is really actually important. Sometimes that gets overlooked. When a non-franchised brand does something, they can 
try things and set standards for things that others can emulate. They decided for all new construction to go as green as they could get, total LED light bulbs throughout, energy efficient appliances throughout. So they are in everything that's new and they can use that as a model for others. So there are brands doing all sorts of wonderful things. Our job at AHLA is to kind of bring that all together to set the standard for what are best practices and then to advocate for it. At the core of what we do every day is we work with politicians. Sounds ugly, right? I used to be a politician. Recovered now completely, so. Uh, but it's, it's not the easiest work. In the US, sometimes it can get very nitty gritty. Uh, you know, it's what you do every single day. Eric and I have a whole team that does the same thing, but I'll tell you where it makes a difference. I'm gonna give a story, and if you heard this last time, don't cheat and answer the question. You were in here last time, right? What state in America do you think, on a per capita basis, has the most electric cars? On a per capita basis? California, California obviously. <laughs> What state's number two? Colorado. Arizona, no. Colorado, no. Keep going. Somebody said Texas, no. New York, no. It's Georgia. It was back in 2018. It might have changed. This is the last time I said. Why is that? Is it because Georgians are really into sustainability? Yes. <laughs> I live there. Good answer, Brandon. I lived there for most of my life, and the answer, sadly, is no. But what they are into is saving money. And so, uh, I was actually in the state legislature, and I think it was back in 2003 or so, we created a $5,000 tax credit for purchasing or leasing an electric vehicle. You already have a federal credit of $7,500. You layer $5,000 on top of that. And what did we were the only state in America that did that. And what did it mean? Everyone's like, I'll give this a shot, especially for a lease. And that was so critical because you might say, I don't want to buy the car, but I'm willing to lease the car and give it a chance. I did it myself. I, I, right when the Nissan Leaf came out, I did it once, then I did it a second time once my lease got up. It was fantastic. But what it did was it changed the minds of the consumers because now they've experienced it. So, you know, the, the anxiety that we talk about a lot about, I'm not going to be able to charge it. How's this going to work? I'm worried about it. They're like, well, they're giving me all this money. I'll just try it. And it worked. And now this continues because you've changed behavior. The reason I say all of that is because public policy matters. And it is, and I know um, you'll talk about it in just a minute, Eric, about the, the carrot and the stick. And when you can create those carrots and get people to change behavior in a way that they normally wouldn't do, you can create a different behavior pattern moving forward. And then they become the greatest advocates. Like I tell people all the time, electric cars are amazing. Not just because they're green, they're like better cars. You should try it, right? I became an advocate because I was encouraged to do so. And when we can create those incentives, you can change behavior pattern. And when behavior pattern changes, things globally can change. Very interesting. And so Eric, US Travel has organized a sustainable travel coalition, presumably building off what you've shared and that input you've been getting uh, in our first round of questions. So why was this coalition put together? Which sectors are participating? And how do you work with them to make an impact? Yeah, great questions. Once the industry decided we're going to engage, the question is what do we do about it? I think one of the challenges that we saw is that everyone was focused on their silo when it came to sustainability. Uh, so what hotels were dealing with was vastly different than what airlines were dealing with and what attractions were dealing with or destinations. But the flip side of that is that travel can't be sustainable until every segment of the industry is sustainable. Uh, so Chip, I don't want to put too much pressure on you, but uh, the rest of the industry is, uh, <laughs> depends, uh, our, our future depends on the lodging sector getting it right and doing sustainability well. If they don't, if meetings are no longer held in large um, uh, lodging uh, properties or destinations, fewer people are going to get on an airline. Uh, if the airlines can't achieve their goals in sustainable aviation fuel, fewer people are going to show up in the lobbies of CHIPS hotels. So we have this collective incentive to advocate together, to work together, uh, because travel can't be sustainable until it's sustainable from end to end. So the coalition is really split into different segments, but it's one unified voice on sustainability issues. Uh, so we have uh, companies that deal with planning and booking, uh, those that are involved in transportation, uh, lodging and resorts, destinations, meetings, events, and attractions. Every business you will cross from the time that you book, uh, travel, or visit a destination and all the way back home is involved within the coalition. Uh, because we think it's important to take that collective approach to our work in sustainability. Second is that we need to highlight what the industry is doing. There's this narrative out there that travel is part of the problem, that travel is an unsustainable practice. And we have to change that narrative when a lot is being done today, a lot of progress has been made, and also we've made substantial commitments for the future. Uh, so we launched this initiative and put it on a website, and the website is called Journey to Clean. And the acknowledgement there is that we are all on separate paths, each segment for sustainability, but we're on a single journey, and that's a journey to clean. And we have to highlight what the industry is doing today and our commitments for tomorrow. And around each segment, you can see that on the website. So for planning and booking uh, today, Google allows for search and sort. 
for airlines and hotels. Uh, you can actually measure uh, what their sustainable practices are. You can choose accordingly. They're going to spread that out to other travel services in the future. The airlines are all investing in R&D for sustainable aviation fuel, and they've made commitments to go carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, Chip was talking about the hotels. Uh, for DC, for destinations, they made a commitment by 2030 to have zero carbon emission events uh, within the city. So uh, no event can be held in the city uh, unless it has a zero carbon footprint. Uh, and then even attractions. Disney has committed to go um, zero emission electricity by 2030 at all of their attractions. So these are significant commitments, which brings us uh, to the last point. We can't get there unless we collectively advocate uh, for government policies that can help accelerate our transformation to a more sustainable industry and provide the incentives uh, to help us get there faster. Uh, so one of the things that we did with the coalition was we lobbied uh, in the lead up to the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we lobbied for a tax credit for sustainable aviation fuel. The aviation industry had been doing this forever. It was airports, it was uh, SAF producers, it was airlines. What had never happened is hotels hadn't shown up at those meetings. Hotels hadn't signed letters. Destinations hadn't gotten involved in that issue. Car rental companies hadn't gotten involved in that issue. When we advocated collectively, you could see the change in the mindset from staff and members of Congress. They would ask why a car rental company was in a meeting talking about SAF uh, when they should be talking about electric vehicles. Uh, but the car rental company was able to easily say that 75% of their customers arrive at an airport. We don't have sustainable aviation fuel. Fewer people are going to hop in an electric vehicle. Uh, so this is just as important to what we're doing as we are on the EV side. Uh, so from the collective approach to highlighting what the industry is doing to collective advocacy, uh, those are the three things that the coalition is focused on. That's excellent. Thank you for that. And we'll circle back on some of the specific outcomes of that collective uh, advocacy together. So, Nate, it's back to you. We've, of course, been talking a lot about what's happening in the U.S. Uh, travel industry, and I, of course, want to take advantage of having you here for a more international perspective. So I'm curious for your views on sort of what is the state of global collaboration on this? How do we all need to work together? And even as a sub-question to that, how is the United States viewed uh, internationally in this whole sustainability and travel conversation? Sure, there are a few sub-questions in there. Let me start first. So like, based on the data that we have seen today, U.S. is moving in the right direction. We have seen the decoupling of the growth from emissions. But of course, like, much more needs to be done so that we can reach net zero by 2050 or even earlier. There are some great initiatives in place that my colleagues today have mentioned here. But it's also about collaboration between international organizations, multinational governmental or, um, collaboration at the national level. So for instance, at WTTC, we have developed hotel sustainability basics program for those hotels who are just starting out their sustainability journey. We have 12 basic criteria that hotels need to achieve with, within the next three years and then move on to other criteria. So there are many initiatives like this in place and it's really important that we all come together and offer consumers the understanding of how that relates to each other, right? So they're not lost in the sea of information so collaboration is definitely key. And as big organizations, um, you know, they, well, um, the majority of, like, of them are on the sustainability journey, but they also need to work with SMEs, with the supply chain, to really move towards net zero. It takes the whole sector, really, to get it right, and everyone. I appreciate that, and I expect yeah. that those of us who are joining WTDC in Rwanda in just a couple of weeks will probably uh, be hearing much more about that uh, global collaboration and government, private sector, small business, big business. So Chip, you know, back to you. At the end of the day, we are talking about a, you know, hopefully a global approach to a, what is a shared common challenge. Can you speak to the issue of you know, collaboration, the importance of collaboration on sustainability across national boundaries uh, in the lodging space? Absolutely. So just last month, we announced a joint venture partnership with the Hotel Association of Canada to introduce what's known as Green Key Global all across North America. And what is that? It's third party certification, which I think is absolutely critical for the long-term success of sustainability, particularly in hotels. And Green Keys is, is designed just for hotels. What it does is it's got a long checklist, 200 to 250 things that a hotel must do to earn a certain number of keys. That's pretty obvious. But the third-party certification is absolutely critical for the consumer. I asked this question last time, so if you were in here, how many people have seen the movie Elf? Do you remember the movie Elf when he's walking down the street in Manhattan and he sees the coffee shop and it says world's greatest coffee and he goes in and he congratulates them because they earned world's greatest coffee. I'm pretty sure no one certified that that was actually the world's greatest coffee. Same thing about sustainability. Everybody wants to say, especially when consumers are demanding it, I'm the most sustainable, but, but are you? And will consumers believe that if everyone says that? 
So at some point, you're going to have to have third-party certification in a significant way. We're encouraging it now, and we believe that it's important to have a single source. If there are, just like everybody claiming they're, they're sustainable, if there are 50 different certifiers, it's going to become very confusing in the marketplace. And so we have most of the brands, most of the global brands have already signed up to support or make Green Key Global their preferred preferred provider for third-party certification. So it's not just in North America. Green Key is also outside of North America, but our partnership is just for, for North America. We think that's absolutely critical because if you get the third-party certification right and consumers can believe it and trust in it, then it encourages the hotel to do it because if they're not doing it, then consumers are not going to choose that. And so um, we think it's really important. We want to get on the front side, as I mentioned a moment ago, to have one consistent source for this across the U.S. and hopefully or across North America, hopefully across the globe. And if we do that, it's going to make an enormous impact. And I think the, the speed at which we will get to reaching these goals will only accelerate as people say, OK, is this hotel certified? Can I trust certification? Boom, let's go. Excellent. Thank you for that. And congratulations on that announcement with the, with the Canadians. So, Eric, you've, you've talked a little bit about the Inflation Reduction Act, how some of the uh, components of that, of that law and, I believe, other uh, similar pieces of legislation really affected by the travel industry coming together with one voice, you know, knowing that we really need end-to-end -end sustainability. So, you know, as part of the United States' is overall, not just limited to the travel space, but as part of our kind of overall efforts to confront uh, climate change, combat climate change, and build resiliency, can you just talk a little bit more about some of the specifics and in fact, some of the really exciting, you know, incentives that have been put in place in the last couple of years, you know, in our economy, in our systems, and in our travel space. As Chip mentioned, there are two basic public policy approaches to trying to influence behavior. One is the carrot, one is the stick. If I'm being honest, we see a lot of sticks in Europe and across the world when it comes to uh, sustainability. The United States is taking a vastly different approach with carrots, and there are two bills in particular that I think can be transformational for the travel industry over the next five to ten years. The first is the Inflation Reduction Act. It's $500 billion in incentives for the development, the deployment of green technologies throughout the economy. The second is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which can modernize our transportation infrastructure. It's $550 billion in new investment, uh, $1.2 trillion in total, for not only making our transportation systems more modern, but making them more sustainable and more resilient. Uh, so those are two areas that we focused in for uh, the, the development and ultimately enactment of both of those bills. The reason that we focused on transportation is if you, you saw the WTTC slide before, uh, the vast majority of our carbon footprint for travel and tourism comes uh, from transportation. It's the aviation sector, and particularly in the United States, where 85% of trips are taken by car. It's the surface transportation, personal uh, vehicles uh, that are contributing substantial amounts to our carbon footprint. So if we're going to be successful, we have to address those two areas. And I think there are, again, a lot of investment opportunities over the next five to 10 years in both of them. So first, for sustainable aviation fuel, it's all about scalability and production. If Delta Airlines uh, took all the sustainable aviation fuel that will be produced this year and used it and operationalized it on their planes, they could operate their global fleet for a day. That's how small, scalable production is today. If you want to play a fun drinking game, hang out with someone who's interested in SAF, take a shot every time they say scalable, you will be wasted in a minute. Uh, it's, it's the biggest challenge that we're uh, facing, but that tax credit is going to be transformational. There are also uh, policies related to the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense is the biggest purchaser of jet fuel anywhere in the world. So transforming that marketplace, mm. uh, making requirements for the Department of Defense to switch to SAF is not only a national security issue because it diversifies our production, uh, but it's also a market issue. It's creating a market for consumer uh, and commercial travel, which will be really important for us. Uh, the second piece is on electric vehicles. You know, it attacked it from a number of different ways. The first was in production. We were less involved in that. But all the automakers in the United States are switching to all electric fleets by 2030. So that's coming. There are incentives to make sure that production happens. The second question is, are these vehicles going to be in consumers' hands? And there were tax incentives to make sure uh, that families could afford and purchase electric vehicles and to incentivize the purchase of any new vehicle going forward uh, to really convert to electric. Uh, and then the last was in the charging infrastructure uh, that allows electric vehicles to be driven anywhere. Uh, right now, a lot of families who have two cars, one might be an electric vehicle, but they absolutely have a second that's usually gas powered, and they're gonna use that to go on vacation. That's gonna be the SUV. The reason for that is range anxiety. 90% uh, of charging that's done today is at the home or the office. Uh, but if you wanna take a, a trip, uh, if you wanna go on I-66, 
uh, if you want to travel to, to Myrtle Beach. The infrastructure that's got to be there, the charging networks that have to be there, really aren't uh, today. And that brings so much anxiety. The investments uh, that'll be made over the next 10 years will be seven and a half billion for charging infrastructure. It was also tax credits for businesses like hotels to put uh, charging stations at their properties. Uh, so there was a multifaceted uh, push for electric vehicle production, uh, use, and charging. A lot of that was about the travel industry and that was a huge success. So someday soon the, the great American road trip could be the green American road trip. Thank you for using that talking point. <laughs> If each of you has just a final thought you'd like to leave the audience with, uh, we'll just go down the line starting with you, Nate. Yes, so perhaps like the most important factors towards for the decarbonization, in my opinion. So it's regulations coming into place. We have ESG regulation. We have government incentives that, that, that will have an impact. Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. is viewed well internationally. There is a blueprint for decarbonization of transport, which was, so the MOU was signed earlier this year. So there's a lot happening on that front. Then, of course, collaboration, we mentioned already, is one of the key factors. I also want to mention education on the consumer side. And then the last one I have is actually social pressure, which I think will have a huge impact on consumers' attitudes towards sustainability. If you look at what happens like drink driving, like obviously there's a fear of the accidents um, and fines, but also there is a social pressure. I'm not sure if this is a good example, but sustainability <laughs> is a critical <laughs> issue. And a generational issue, yeah. perhaps. So yeah. if you're hanging out with these people taking shots <laughs> every time well, they yeah, say exactly. that, you're gonna have to. Use, use Uber. Like, I think that is uh, me for this example now, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, I'll, I'll, be, from you. I'll be real quick. Look, consumers are moving this direction. Uh, you mentioned a moment ago the, the auto manufacturers. There's a huge fight going on in the U.S. right now between striking auto workers who don't want to do this, right? They don't actually want to go green because it reduces jobs. But that's like, I always use this analogy, that's like the candle maker is saying, we don't want light bulbs. It's coming. It's here. It's a better technology. And let's use it in a way that's good for the economy. The biggest challenge I think sometimes we face is that sometimes people, they are so focused on sustainability, they don't recognize the economic impact. The reality is, is that wealth creates the opportunity to invest, and you must have the opportunity to invest if you want to make changes. And so if you believe that you can destroy the economy and create a greener environment, it's not going to work. You have to have a thriving economy, which public policy plays an enormous role in. And when an economy is doing well, they have the ability to make major wholesale investments that can change things. So economics and sustainability should be coupled together. Thank you, Chip. Eric, final thought from you. Now, I think the travel industry in the United States has a very short window, five to 10 years, to make those transformational investments. When $1.5 trillion is available, uh, we have to make sure that not only do we advocate for it, uh, but we go out and we seek those investments. And I think that'll be the big focus. This is our opportunity. This is our window for transformational change. If we're not out there trying to, to, to get those dollars, and the competition is fierce, uh, we're going to be left behind. Uh, so that's going to be a big focus of ours. Uh, and I think really it can make uh, the United States a destination that used to be viewed as uh, perhaps the least sustainable to one of the most sustainable around the world. And that's a big opportunity. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for spending a little extra time with us. And thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Driven by consumer demand, climate impact, and many other factors, sustainability is clearly part of travel's future. Through collaboration, education, innovation, and your participation, the travel industry can most certainly ensure a vibrant future. And that's it for today for Brand USA Talks Travel. Lots more Travel Week episodes coming. I'm Mark Lapidus. Thanks for listening. This episode was produced by Asher Mirovich, Thanze Karaoke, and Casey D'Ambra. Special thanks to Alexis Adelson and Phil Dickison. Engineering by Brian Watkins. If you enjoyed this Live from Travel Week UK and Europe episode, please share it with your friends in the travel industry. Safe travels.